So one of those issues is yes, that they can be very inaccurate, but maps can also be hard to gauge because you don't have like a real time representation of where you are on a physical map. Uh, a sextant is another historical method of navigation that was developed for the Royal Navy in the 1700s. Um, it used the alignment of the sun and horizon in order to gauge direction and distance. So again, because the horizon represents a point on the actual globe um, and not just the flat edge of the world, um, it's possible to use that, that horizon in, in relation to the sun and position of the sun in order to gauge distance. And probably the most famous and popular, well, widely, known mem uh, widely known method of navigation is the compass. And it was developed everywhere. Uh, this one is from ancient China in the 12th century. And uh, Europe, European countries also developed their own compasses. And they looked a lot uh, like this. And they, were, uh, they relied on the Earth's magnetic core to gauge direction. So all of these primitive forms of navigation all functionally accomplish the same purpose, which is to guide somebody to a location they need to be according to distance and position. So here are some technically modern or evolved forms of navigation. So, sorry. excuse me for just a second. All right, um, here are some technologically modern forms of navigation. Um, Radio navigation, radar navigation, satellite navigation, and acoustic navigation. So radar navigation, for example, um, uses the bouncing of radio waves off of objects beyond what the naked eye can see in order to um, gauge distance. And it can create computerized representations of these objects in the distance, as you can see on the screen here. And another form of modern navigation is satellite navigation, including the famous GPS. The United States Space Force, which is a new branch of the military, has um, developed a lot of new systems of satellite navigation in order to aid um, travel across the United States. Um, and satellite navigation is purely electronic and has to do with relaying information about somebody's position on the globe towards a satellite, um, which can then give you a real time representation of where you, exactly you are, which is something that ancient forms of navigation obviously lacks. So acoustic navigation is another interesting form of navigation because it deals with sound instead of radio waves. Um, acoustic navigation, as an example of um, modern navigation, uh, can be applied to anything from submarines to even humans. You know, humans can actually use a form of sonar, not as effective as a bat, of course, but pretty much anything with a set of ears can use sound to roughly gauge where it is or how far away objects are from it. Um, so- I have a question. Uh, yeah. What, what and we base it? acoustic navigation off like echolocation because it's both, they both relate to sound. Uh, yes, actually echolocation is a form of sonar. So echolocation is also called biosonar because in essence, it's the exact same thing. Echolocation and sonar are basically the same thing. They are both forms of acoustic uh, navigation. They use sound and information about uh, how long it takes for an echo to reach you to gauge the distance between you and an object. Make sense or anything else? Yeah, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right. So again, navigation in the past, um, all ancient civilizations designed maps of varying accuracy for navigating their own land and included guesses as to what lay beyond. And this is the important part because Navigating, navigating historically has always been important because humans have constantly been exploring beyond what they know um, to be there. Like, for example, when exploring the New World or North America, Europeans had to make guesses about what might be beyond what they could see because they wanted to explore um, 
beyond the land that they already knew is there to discover new things. And so these guesses, while inaccurate, did serve as, you know, like rough representations of what could actually be there. For example, if you see a mountain range in the distance, it's not like too far of an assumption that um, there could be, I don't know, another civilization or another river running through that mountain, um, and also canyons as well. So the development of the compass was also another important historical landmark in navigation. Um, you know, every single civilization kind of developed it, their own primitive form. Um, and then there was a sextant in the 18th century. All right, so, and here we uh, digress and kind of go into what detection is. Detection is sort of this offshoot of navigation because the same technologies that are used to navigate in the modern context, like radar, can also be used to detect incoming objects. So instead of trying to figure out what um, your surroundings are so you can move around them, um, because of the way that modern navigation works, which involves like uh, sketching the surroundings beyond what you can see with the computer, you can also use that and use the information about what's beyond what you can see to your advantage, for example, in the military. Um, detection revolves around, um, as the name might suggest, detecting things beyond what you can see, anything from missiles to asteroids to weather. Um, for example, uh, detection is useful for detecting in, uh, incoming phenomena like the ones I just listed. Uh, and one of the best examples is the early alarm system, like the early warning radar. And these radars can detect incoming ballistic missiles. Uh, I know it's always been sort of a big threat since the 1950s of nuclear war, um, especially with not so um, far in the past news like of North Korea, we want to know if there are missiles incoming that might hit us. These missiles travel at incredible uh, speeds and actually go up into the atmosphere. So as they come down using the aid of gravity, they can read ridiculous, they can reach ridiculous speeds up to, I believe like 16 times the speed of sound. It's impossible to see these with the naked eye. So we need detection systems to tell us that they're coming so that civilians can potentially get out of the way of harm. Um, Detection is highly useful for a lot of different fields, but it's very useful for the military because detection systems were developed for the military. Um, combat in the later half of the 20th century kind of became longer range and faster paced. So it was important to know what was coming at you and what speed. Yeah, 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 to prevent Kim Jong-un from, uh, from getting any ideas, yeah. Because if Kim Jong-un knows that we know that he's coming, he's not going to attempt anything because he's just going to get killed before he can actually do anything to us. Um, technology is developed off of navigation systems for the express purpose of detecting bodies. So uh, I guess, does Korea have more nukes than us? Uh, no, they don't. They don't. North Korea has, I believe, like 50 nuclear warheads of much lower power than the United States. Actually, what's interesting is... Um, the biggest powerhouses of the world, the United States and Russia, have actually been downscaling their nuclear arsenals. We've been getting rid of a lot of nukes because of how, how dangerous they are. Yes, Korea has about, last time I checked, it was like 50, but the United States and Russia have like thousands and thousands of thousands of them. So uh, I, I forget what the exact statistic is, but we could destroy the North Korea's entire country um, dozens of times over. But the issue is that Kim Jong-un has total power and he's crazy. Yeah, 3,000. Oh, and that's not even including the nuclear weapons that um, NATO and the European Union have. Like, countries like Great Britain and France are our allies and they have their own nuclear weapons too. Okay, I digress though. Uh, back to detection. There is an extremely wide range of opportunities for the application of these technologies. Um, Military, astronomy, communications, infrastructure, geography, archaeology, field research, etc. One thing that for sure emulates the path of, for example, um, a missile, an incoming ballistic missile, is an asteroid. And in order to track asteroids, astronomers at NASA and uh, space agencies all over the world use radar detection. Yeah, um, unfortunately, North Korea kind of diverts the funds that should be used to be feeding their people into creating nuclear weapons. That's where they're getting the money. Um, 
Like in archaeological and geographic fields, you can um, detect things far below the ground, which are subterranean. Um, here are some basic methods in fields of detection. There's object detection, which uh, has to do with the ever-increasing field of AI. Isn't there two types of nukes? I think that you're referring to nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. Fission bombs are like, they essentially have to do with the colliding of two atoms. And fusion bombs, kind of. Yeah, there are two. I'm sure there are, there are, there are many more, but the two the two like doctrinal kinds are fission is driven by the splitting of the atom by colliding, and fusion is driven by the energy produced when two atoms combine. Which is also the same process that um, creates stars that gives stars their energy. Oh, uh, and also you might've heard of like hydrogen bombs, uranium and plutonium. Uranium and plutonium are two like popular, um, popular materials for using nuclear, for creating nuclear weapons, but there are many other elements that can be used in nuclear weapons. Okay, anyways, uh, some methods and fields of detection are object detection. Um, which has to do with the ever increasing field of AI or artificial intelligence um, and deals in, for example, a computer knowing just exactly what objects are in its surroundings. So an AI driving, an AI driven car uh, can use object detection to know that there's another car six feet in front of it. Uh, radar detection has to do with using radar, um, but instead of building a scope of its surroundings, Radar detection can um, allow, for example, the military to know if there is a fleet of incoming ships or planes. Uh, for example, uh, in the attack on Pearl Harbor, the US military was able to see the planes coming a little bit early, especially in the second wave. Sonar is another uh, method of detection, very similar to radio detection, but using the principle of sonar. So using sound to detect an object in the water. Um, and geography and archaeology are two other, um, two other fields that can be positively affected by methods of detection uh, so that geographers and archaeologists can know what's beneath the ground without having to mine or uh, blow through the surface. And radar astronomy, which I already touched on a little bit, is where astronomers can use radar to um, gauge celestial bodies. So they can understand what the surfaces of planets might look like even below the planet surfaces. They can know all about asteroids and uh, faraway galaxies. And it takes much, much less time than having to physically send a satellite over there to get like a visual image. Um, so yeah, uh, radar astronomy is a really interesting um, field because it highlights the efficiency of using radar as opposed to older methods. Um, here are three large, uh, here are three of the, of, here are three technologies that best exemplify the fields of detection and navigation. Um, radar stands for radio detection and ranging. It can track nearly anything from planes to weather and to missiles. And bouncing microwaves, um, not microwaves like the ones that you use to cook your food, like the types of um, radio waves that you can't see. Bouncing microwaves are measured for several properties. So with radar, a radio wave, a microwave to be specific, is sent out from a transmitter and bounces off of anything in the distance and comes back to a receiver, which can then measure the properties of that microwave to discern like anything from the texture of the object to the size of the object, to what the object is made of, to how fast it's moving and where it's moving to. Um, and radar can be used for both detection and navigation. It can be used for detection in order to um, see anything that's coming at you or moving away from you beyond what you can see as well as being able to um, draw on a computer screen the surroundings beyond the fancy. Imagine bouncing microwave ovens. 
That's a scary thought. I have enough trouble with my microwave as it's not bouncing. Um, LIDAR is another example. It stands for light detection and ranging, and you're seeing probably like the theme between DAR and DAR, like radar, LIDAR. Yeah, they um, kind of share the acronym as well as the function. Uh, LIDAR stands for light detection and ranging, and instead of radio waves, it uses the bouncing of light in the form of lasers. Um, does everybody, does anybody here know what laser stands for? You can just drop it in the chat or say it. Laser stands for, well, light, ampli light amplification by the simulate, stimulated emission of radiation. Oh, wow. You know, even if you Googled that, that's still a good answer because I wasn't able to pronounce those words the first time I read it either. Um, yeah, lasers are essentially extremely concentrated beams of light and can be used for to serve the function of LIDAR by um, uh, bouncing back towards a receiver and giving information just like microwaves and radar. Um, Response time can be measured, which is instantaneous because light travels so fast, so it's extremely efficient, more so than, for example, sonar, because light travels way faster than sound, and so light can get back to a receiver much faster than sound can. Um, yeah, that's an extremely, Aaron, like what you just put is an extremely verbose, which means like convoluted and complicated way of explaining that a laser is just a really, really concentrated beam of light. Um, and lasers are really powerful. Like, la the laser guns that you see in sci-fi movies aren't even that far away from what we could be having in reality pretty soon. Um, probably not, because the laser got invented many, 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 many years ago before laser tech could have existed. Anyways, I, I digress again. Um, LiDAR can be really useful for anything from AI-driven cars to measuring land formations such as dense rainforest. It will be really tedious to go into the rainforest yourself um, or for humans or a group of researchers to go in there themselves. So a plane or aircraft can be flown over a rainforest and measure the treetops and foliage with LiDAR in order to get an accurate image of it. So that image can um, be used for anything from navigation, moving through the rainforest accurately to gauging the health of the rainforest to um, anything that might be living in. Uh, LIDAR, just like radar, can measure distance, speed, size, and from how the beam of light is affected, it can measure texture and material. And the last example that we have, sonar, is a form of acoustic navigation. Acoustic means sound, and so Sonar deals with navigating by sound. Sonar is useful for submarines, animals, oceanographers, and much, much more because it works well in water. The issue with something like LIDAR is that, um, for example, light could, um, for example, light could travel too far in water or it doesn't travel very well in water in order to reflect. Um, whereas sound can provide a reliable benchmark for um, where something is in the water. So uh, sonar works well in water, which makes it useful for submarines, ships, and oceanographers who might be wanting to know what the seafloor looks like without having to dive all the way down to the seafloor themselves, and which would require, you know, submarines themselves, water vibrations. So sound itself is a vibration which is essentially what sonar is. It sends a vibration, a sound through the water um, and comes back. The pings that you like would stereotypically hear while a radar system or a sonar system is activated, like ding, like the periodic pings that you would hear are just the pulses of microwaves and uh, sound waves being sent out. The, the actual wave of sound doesn't sound anything like that. It's of a very low frequency or a very high frequency um, to high or low for the human ear to hear. The sonar involves the tracking of sound response time to derive properties. So it might not provide as much information of 
the terrain as radar or lidar, LIDAR would on land. But again, the bonus of sonar is that it works very well through water and air alike, and it is also very, very um, reliable and consistent. Um, also, one important thing to note about these uh, technologies in one of their main applications, which is in the military, is that they can actually be defeated or their effects negated by um, countermeasures. So there's, sorry, um, that was a slide too far ahead. For example, paint exists that can absorb the microwaves or absorb the sound waves so that an object is invisible to something trying to track them. But otherwise, these systems have all developed to be very reliable and useful. And one, not exactly an honorable mention, but a topic deserving of its own slide is echolocation. Because echolocation is a natural form of, um, echolocation is a natural form of navigation detection that can be used by nearly every living thing, nearly every animal can use echolocation. Um, all of these topics will, by the way, get their own lessons in the future and go very in depth. Echolocation is also called biosonar, bio meaning living sonar, um, and deals with living things that can use it. Uh, echolocation is used for navigating and detection because it can detect disturbances, movement, and prey. Uh, if you've ever heard the phrase blind as a bat, bats can't see very well, so they use sound in the form of echolocation in order to quote unquote see, because the function of sight is, yeah. um, bats can use sound to navigate the surroundings instead of seeing the surroundings visually. Um, bats along with dolphins are a good example of echolocation, but in a reality, a very wide variety of animals like whales, shrews, and birds can all use echolocation. And it involves measuring distance through the echo of a call, which sounds very similar to sonar because it is essentially the same thing. Um, the time that it takes for a sound to bounce back to you, or in this case, the receivers are your ears and your hearing, uh, is measured in order to gauge how far the object that the echo bounced off of is from you. Uh, and in this way, bats, for example, could um, find the location of their prey, which would be, for example, like moths in the air, because sounds that they emit from their body biologically bounce back to their ears, and they can use the time that it takes for that to happen in order to know exactly where and how far away their prey is. Um, and again, echolocation, as I said, could be used by any living thing. So even humans, uh, even if you don't really realize it consciously, humans can use echolocation as well. Um, through sound, uh, by using sound to sort of know how far away like a wall is from you, or if there's anything near you, um, you're using echolocation. Um, also, if somebody calls out to you, the volume of that sound and um, the echo of that sound can also be used for you to determine how far away they are than you. Um, anyways, I believe that kind of, that wraps it up for today. Um, this lesson's kind of cut short, but in the future, we're gonna have lengthier lessons that go in depth on radar, sonar, and LIDAR, as well as echolocation. So uh, thank you all for coming.